All right, so we have a new episode of Legends and Leaders, and today it's great to have Gina here. So Gina, you're somebody that um, has been pretty innovative in terms of putting together campaigns and creating um, you know, really interesting experiences to help bring out, whether it's movies or other types of projects, brand collaborations. You've done this with Toy Story. You've done this with um, you know, just a bunch of different uh, movies, including The Greatest Showman. And you've also helped try to figure out the right brand partners for some of these different activations, which is a unique thing to figure out in and of itself. So I'm excited to have you here and to get into your story. Thank you. I'm excited to talk to you today. Awesome. So Gina, where do your passion for business leadership and wanting to kind of build your own thing and being in this you know, creative space, how did this passion begin and how did you kind of get started? So I started my career in HR. Um, human resources. And so it was a very different place to start um, and ultimately ended up um, getting asked from one of my clients in the client group in marketing if I wanted to hop over to marketing. Right. Um, and I'd been a fashion merchandising major, which had a lot of marketing components. And I really missed the creative aspect um, because I always pretty create in, you know, danced and did drama and, you know, a lot of different types of things that were, you know, kind of leaned in on um, the creative side. Del artist, um, not really that great of an artist anymore, lost a little bit of that. Um, and ultimately, um, just kind of weaved my way through almost all of the types of, um, you know, groups within um, a company. Um, and after I had my child, I decided to go out on my own. I started my first agency. Um, and that was kind of more focused on data and it, it just really was not in the, in the realm of where I saw myself going out. Um, and, um, so the craftsman was kind of born out of just saying, I, I want to get up every day and, you know, just kind of focus on the craft of marketing and advertising and do really creative things. And I was like, you know, I just want to be a craftsman. And I was talking to somebody, um, who is a good friend and also former colleague. And she was like, you should go see if that is available. And yeah. so that was just kind of, it was, it's our, we have the longest URL ever because the craftsman <laughs> wasn't, but the craftsman agency was. And we just started pitching art and creative ideas. And, and that's how the showman and the chocolate train and some of those things came about. Mm -hmm. So how did you, like, what's kind of like your creative process? Like, how do you start, you know, to come up with an interesting idea? Is it you, like, how do you identify, like, okay, well, this is what they need, but this is really what can be the most successful here. Like, what does it take to come up with interesting and unique ideas that stand out and not just do the same typical stuff? Oh, it is not a linear process. I always say um, a lot of times as we're going to be ideating, I, I'm literally thinking about it for a week and a half to two weeks as I'm walking around sort of like just living life. Um, and a lot of times there will be something that will come up that will be like, oh, that could actually work in terms of the idea. And so a good example of that is for VMware. We had been in a briefing and they said, basically, you know, the solution can be fit. They can find the problem and fix it within a minute. And I was watching a show with my family and it was um, minute to win it. And I was like, hmm, minute to fix it. That's kind of catchy. You could create some sort of quick player game, which we know this audience in the tech side likes. Um, and so then that was kind of born. It's it. We built a little city and basically electricity and water are good sort of, um, you know, it, almost examples for storytelling in terms of what like networking and infrastructure is like for an IT perspective. Um, so fun way to do the game. And um and honestly, like the inspiration for Strange World and creating an environment for children and that that campaign was really being in Japan and going through team labs. They have they have this like one room that kind of reminded me of Strange World and we knew we were pitching on it. And we were, I was in that room and I was like, mm, we could create some things and bring strange world into this environment that it felt really tactile and have the children really experience it. And that's where the concept of like having a, um, a, a, those ball, you know, like 
the ball pits, um, having the ball pit um, kind of fit and looked a lot like um, some of the parts of the film. And so it really is just going around and sort of absorbing life. And, and then sometimes it is a lot of research. That certainly is how I got up with the chocolate train um, for Murder on the Orient Express. So you just kind of pull from different places that you've been or, you know, what looks, it's kind of what looks similar or what can, what can you create based on the experiences you've had? Yeah. And then sometimes it's just research. Um, and then sometimes it's like connecting a story. So guardians of the galaxy and duo, they both guard their own universes. Mm -hmm. That storyline was pretty, pretty like just kind of just felt like it matched so well. And that's where that, you know, brand partnership came together. Um, I'm making it sound simpler. That was a lot of negotiation and discussions between the two companies. But, um, but, but yeah, I mean, a lot of it has to do with the story. A lot of it has to do with what might seem similar, but unexpected. Um, what, yeah, there it, just some of its research, you know, based on some of the trends. Um, so it, again, not, not very linear. Mm -hmm. So can you break down, Gina, like, you know, the structure for um, the Greatest Showman campaign? Like, you know, how did the conversations begin? How did they change maybe throughout in terms of what the creative vision was? And what type of success did you see on execution of the campaign that maybe you were surprised by? Or, you know, what and what did you learn overall? Like, kind of just break down how that started and what happened from it. Yeah, the Greatest Showman was such a great campaign. Well, first of all, it was one of the first pitches from a craftsman perspective that was really associated with that sort of art and working with artists and influencers were pretty different at that point in time. I mean, it's, um, you know, it wasn't, you didn't have as many selfie takers. It was a lot more creators. Instagram was a far different platform than it is today. It was, it was really much more about the still photography um, with a little bit of video, but really it was all in feed, right? It wasn't, it didn't have stories. I don't think was even around. So we came up with the concept of, or I came up with the concept of Hope Circus, which was basically finding people that could create a look based on their medium. And so that's where we were, worked with like wigs and makeup. And um, it was, oh, it was supposed to also be global. Um, and that, you know, they all had different angles. Like Fairy Toss was a really, really cool costume. Um, and she took an amazing picture with the horse. Um, and designer daddy, it, he, he did it. He he's cosplay costume designer. He's now making wedding dresses really kind of really got his start in a lot of ways. I mean, he had a following, but he went, he started at like 50,000 when he was working with us. And now I think he's over, um, over 500,000. Um, but you know, he, he sort of leaned into that aspect of having them, um, the daughter and, you know, mother relationship. And so that, that, you know, that was really very cool. Um, the campaign was super successful. It ended up, it was only going to be rest of world. And because designer daddy was domestic, the domestic team actually hopped on. We ended up sharing the content, um, on some of the Fox channels and, um, the engagement was off the charts. Um, it really helped kick off the theatrical campaign and nobody knew showman was going to be like that big, I think. Um, but once it hit the theater, the theater, like it's just, it was so, um, the, it just really complemented the overall campaign. Um, studio was super excited. All the, the, all the creators were, were super excited. And we, um, we delivered, you know, something like 5 million engagements or something crazy town for organic. <laughs> so, and um, it was all in kind. So we basically paid their expenses. We, it wasn't, you know, it was one of those, the early days of the influencer, basically. So do you think it was like one of the main, main major reasons for success was the art of it? Like if you had to break it down to like, like two or three things, like what do you think were the core aspects that stood out in, in general for the campaigns that you work on that can lead to a success? 
I think that it's always that we are tying the stories together and we're figuring out how do we tell the story in a different, unique way. And for showmen, that was taking those themes of circus, which has a lot of, you know, a lot of kind of mixed feelings for a lot of people. Um, but it was it was such a fascinating story um, about Burnham. And so it just I think it we we took basically all of these different mediums and we told the story in a different way that was authentic to those creators. In any case, we're always wanting to say, how can you layer that story and how can you connect it from platform to platform? Is it going to be from going from social to, you know, in person? Um, it's that connection point that is such so critical in figuring out where that connection point is. And sometimes it's obvious, but a lot of times it's not. Hmm. So. so it's just, it's continuity, like the story. There's continuity, there's cross pollination. So, you know, a lot of times um, things will be more, uh, things will be more, from an integrated campaign perspective and when you're when you're doing a tactic and working with a creator for instance if you um like for corella we worked with an artist on the chocolate dolls we connected the dots with creators as well as press and we sent them boxes but then also disney eats did a behind the scenes as the as the artist did too she didn't have as much of a following. So putting it on Disney Eats was actually great for her because she was tagged. But then also everybody likes to understand, you know, all the fun facts or the behind the scenes. And that continues to give your campaign some of those integrated touch points. We believe that the integrated campaign is more powerful than just like drop it and hope that, you know, hope that this one thing really gets traction. Um, so when you're building something that is a, any asset, having all of these other touch points really helps kind of get a better ROI for the big thing that you're creating. Comic book, chocolate train, whatever it is that mm -hmm. is going to be that asset, making sure that you're publishing and how you're really gonna reach the audience is really well thought out and really well executed. Mm -hmm. Gina, would you say that like organic is generally the best type of impressions to get? Does it really matter organic first paid, you know, and like what's kind of, is it because like organic is your audience anyhow, and they're just like, I mean, they're more inclined to look at it. Like, are there really differences between organic and paid? Right. Well, that's kind of a trick question. <laughs> I think, no, <laughs> the platforms always start really great from an organic perspective, right? but then they have to monetize. And I mean, we all understand that we're all running businesses, so it, it make it makes sense. So I would say that an organic engagement is much more valuable because that means it's relevant and your audience actually cares and they're, they're actually paying attention to your brand. And so from that perspective, it means that you've been doing your job in terms of giving them the right kind of content. You're not just amplifying um, because, you know, the, the algorithm will, the minute you start just, just really amplifying and not connecting with your audience and not giving them things that they care about, or you're boring them to death, then you, you basically lose that engagement. And then you lose that, you know, the algorithm basically takes away your organic, um, you know, benefit of getting that in front of your community. Paid does have its place um, and it can help you extend your audience. And many, in many times we're trying to convert and we're trying to drive demand or direct response. And so from that perspective, you need paid. You can also use paid to boost a little bit so that maybe you do get in front of your audience that you're, you're trying to. Um, we like boosting for something that's a high value piece of content. Um, I personally still think that organic is so powerful. Um, mm. Like Oreo is a great example. They, they do such great content that they just, they do drive a lot of engagement. Um, and you're so much better off if you really have built that brand relate brand, you know, consumer relationship, um, so that they care. I mean, that's, and there's a lot of studies. There's a meaningful brand study that's done every year that basically the direction is like something like 85% and it increases every time of consumers don't care if your brand goes away. 
And I, when I, when I talk to people and I, I, I go over the concept of loyalty, when I'm speaking like on stage, I talk about that. And I always say, just look around the room. That means that they only care about 15% of you. Um, so organic is a way to have them care, I believe. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So in terms of like, you know, when you're putting together um, like some sort of campaign, you're going to go and run it and you want to have, there's the balance between organic and paid. Um, how do you kind of like structure when you're structuring the content? Like how do you type, like help advise and structuring content? You know, cause a lot of time brands go and they put content out there, maybe like Oreo, for example, where it's like very organic. It's really just about the brand, but it's not necessarily towards driving a sale. Like how That's important true. is it to balance that? Like, how do you balance that out? And you know, should most of your content be focused on driving towards sales? Should just be organic? Like how do you figure that balance? I mean, it's a, that's a great question. I mean, I really, it's you've got to have a balance, right? Because you have to you have to show a return on investment. And I think um, there's you know a lot of CMOS are kind of in the hot seat right now because you you have to be able to drive demand. But then we know that demand is better if you have really great awareness. So it's you know really thinking about that full funnel is super important. There's different pieces of content, no matter what type of industry you're in, that you're going to want to have through through the full funnel. So we believe in sort of that brand to demand and sort of mapping the types of content. Um, and the types of content really varies based on the audience. If there's a balance between paid and organic from a social perspective. Events tend to be a place where you really can activate people. Um, and get some of that direct response as well. So we really believe in a good activation or, you know, doing something really interesting at like an industry trade show, for instance. So that answers your like, question. It answers it. I mean, like today, like brands like Duolingo, for example, you know, like they have this mascot they've created and a lot of their content is just kind of around that. Like, I just wonder how much of that's really driving, you know, users to what they're doing. Uh, but, I, but like what you mentioned, it's about driving that awareness. The more awareness you have, the better you can kind of capitalize off it. Yeah, I mean, it's it, they're actually we look at a lot of examples in the marketplace um, because when you're creative, you, you've got to appreciate everyone's creative. Right. I mean, it's I appreciate what somebody else is doing. We do look at Duolingo because they do some really cool things like um, Liquid Death is also one that we look at because they just are so outrageous. Um, but I think what's really key about about like a Duolingo or a, a Liquid Death is that they're always on brand and they, they stay consistent and true to their brand. Um, and that's really, I think, I, I mean, I think that's really what makes the big difference, but yeah, it's a fair question. Huh. So what has like kind of been your, your toughest project? I mean, you go in there, there's a creative vision that they want. You have your, you know, ideas of what you want to be able to do. Um, you know, what kind of has been like the difficulties in getting it to be, to come to a place where you guys both agree um, how have you kind of figured stuff like that? And like what overall has been the most difficult to execute and get the success on? I think that most of the time our like the toughest project ends up being the one that your client is fearful and mm -hmm. doesn't want to take the risks, but you're, you're, you're doing a campaign that is going to take risks. So you have to, <laughs> You have to kind of, it's almost like part creative, part psychologist where you're like trying to get them to be brave. Those are always really hard because half of the time you have lost a lot of your planning window because they were a little bit fearful and you got to the place where they decided to do it. And you don't you don't have enough time, so you're also trying to compress that into two to three weeks, um, which we've pulled off fantastic campaigns. Um, but I would say it's when the marketer is fearful and they're they're just they want to take the risk, but they they it's just really hard for them to go all the way through the process. Um, those are hard because you, as their partner, you feel so so much pressure 
Um, but you also feel so bad because you, all we really want our clients to do is feel like they're supported and that they're, you know, that that we're sort of that bright spot on their calendar and that we're always, you know, kind of providing them um, that trusted advisor position. Um, and so it just it kind of like your heart breaks a little bit because you know how much sleep they're getting each night because they're so stressed out. Um, and when we bring those crazy ideas, we're not trying to stress someone out. We're trying to actually um, have it be really successful for them. And we do find at the end of the day, it is successful. So that um, that's probably when it's most challenging. Mm -hmm. So Gina, like how linear is it for brands? Like if, you know, everyone has a budget for whatever campaign they want to do, um, you know, if the budget's much larger, let's say it's like three times larger, like does it, like how often does it literally increase in terms of the output they can have from engagement and impressions? Is it, it does it really, you know, work like that pretty often where it's like, oh, more spend, it will be X amount double, you know, or X amount more of this, or is it just the, is the creativity just so significant and there's a certain baseline budget that you can work with that will really get what you want? Like, how does it, that generally work? I think we try to work with most budgets. I mean, there certainly is sort of a baseline that, that, you know, that makes it difficult to get the kind of results. Cause you know, it's that person that comes and says, I want, you know, I want to do a viral video and I'm always like, okay, well, let's step back. You don't ever seek doing something viral because that's the first way to fail is that you're ex you're expecting that something's going to pick up and very few things actually go viral. Um, but is it popular with your audience and is it driving the bright business results? That's what we try to talk about. When you go, when you go kind of linearly and you add more media budget to it, which I think is kind of what you're getting to is really based on the media. It only really delivers more if you have the content to support it. So if you're, if you only have like two pieces of content and you're, you know, driving more and more revenue, or more and more ad, ad dollars, it won't necessarily make it that you have a better result. You're going to have to have multiple touch points and, and different kinds of content. So in our opinion, unless you're, because, because something like a Super Bowl ad is going to cost you a lot of money. There's always a lot of question on how effective are those? Sometimes mm -hmm. it's more effective to do a YouTube campaign, for instance, um, and use half of the money, you know, half of the typical yeah. dollars spend that you would. So it's, um, so not, yeah, not necessarily. I don't think it does always exponentially go up. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Like, so around, you mentioned the Super Bowl, around the Super Bowl, you know, Mr. Beast usually likes to say, or he said this this year, like, oh, I'm generating, you know, it's going to be 100 million people watch it. I'm doing that in every video. Like, how important is the placement of where your, you know, your ad or your uh, media is going to be? Like, is it really, does it matter? Like, will you, you know, maybe the, would the return of the Super Bowl be comparable potentially to the return on, an, on a typical Mr. Beast video because they can have similar viewership numbers? Like, how, how different is that? Or is there any difference? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I Mr. Beast is, he is just a case study in, in terms of, you know, content um, creator and just the reach he gets. I personally think he's more powerful because he's going to be telling a story he, that supports your brand. Um, and he has such a strong affinity. When you're running a Super Bowl ad, it's not that those, those teams have such a an affinity with the brands that are running on those spots. So is, is the placement important? A hundred percent. There is the sort of cold placements, almost like a cold call. The, the Super Bowl ad in some ways is that way. It's probably your audience because there's a lot of people watching it, but Mr. Beast hits a very specific target. And so in some ways his content is you know, it will generate more for you from a revenue standpoint, because you're probably going to have a more direct call to action as well. Hmm. Well, Gina, just the last question that I have, you know, yeah. at this point in your career, we've done a bunch of different interesting things, been involved in many campaigns. You know, what do you aspire to accomplish next? Like, what are some things that you'd like to do that you haven't done yet? I just wrote a book. Um, so that was one thing that's always been on my list um, and published it with a good friend. Um, Maybe write a book by myself. I mean, I would like to do a, I would like to do a Super Bowl ad. Um, I think that that would be kind of killer um, for the right brand. Um, 
but um, I don't know. I'm having so much fun where doing what we're doing today. And I just want to continue to kind of expand on that. Is that sort of a cop out? <laughs> no, it sounds good. Yeah. Well, appreciate you coming on and I'm definitely excited to see what you'll continue to do next and some of the new creative things you'll create. Um, Thank thanks. you. Thanks. I appreciate it.